Welcome to today's study. The title is The Wind Behind the Rock. Before we get into scripture, let's begin by understanding the science behind the facts. The theory of propulsion is the action or process of pushing to drive an object forward. A propulsion system consists of a source of power or energy, and that is called the propulsor which means of converting this power into a propulsive force. With regard to rocks or stones, they are matter in some form. In this case, we are looking at rocks, are composed primarily of grains of minerals, which are crystalline solids formed from atoms chemically bonded into an orderly structure. Therefore, for any type of rock, be it small or even a large meteorite, to move through space, it must be propelled by a propulsor or force called energy which is associated with fire in one way or the other as it's, com as it's a combustible force. However, all the human eye can capture the moment is viewing a mass of matter, in this case a rock or a meteorite, in movement through the night sky. You can never view the propelling force behind the rock, as the human eye cannot capture the force called the wind. Now, moving into scripture, we will see a very similar process taking place, though we never saw it from a scientific perspective. In Genesis 2 and verse 7, the word of God says, And Hashem, that means the name of God, formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, let's examine this process with much care. The Lord gathers grains of minerals, which are crystalline solids, formed from atoms, chemically bonded into an orderly structure or a shape of future man. Now, this mass of atoms is really what we would call common dirt, and in Hebrew, it's called odom, which is where you get the English word Adam from, needs to move the shape of the matter. And this can only be done through propulsion. The Lord God breathes or propels his force of wind or air or his breath, the Ruah, into this mass of dirt shaped as a man. And wow, what happens next? The word of the Lord says he became a living being and instead of flying through the air like a rock or a meteorite, man begins to move on the earth or begins to walk as there is now an active or a living energy moving this mass of matter called the human being. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, the word of God says, The rock, his work is perfect. Therefore, is not the creation that is a type of rock perfect. But this rock called Odom fell into imperfection and inside from a point of view of outside he was still the same shape. But in Genesis 3 he falls spiritually. Though he was shaped in the form of man or Odom and we might not recognize his fall there, he fell in the spirit. The word of God says in Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. Now here, the prophet Isaiah is using a metaphor as a stone for the Messiah. In 1 Peter 2.6, Peter is using the very similar passage to describe what he sees in his epistle to us. Second, 1 Peter 2.6 For this is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and who he, he who believes in it will not be disappointed. Now here he's going further to say that Whoever believes in this cornerstone will not be disappointed. 
But what is Peter doing really? He's pointing back to the Tanakh, or what you might commonly call the Old Testament, about the rock mentioned in Deuteronomy 32.4 as the perfect rock, Yeshua, Messiah, our Lord. This is further confirmed by the Lord himself in Matthew 16.18, where the Lord addresses the apostles, though speaking to Peter, where he confirms two things. He says he is the rock and those that follow him, the ecclesia, not the church, and your English Bibles will say, on this rock I shall build my church, that, brothers and sisters, is errant transliteration. There was no church at that time. It was Israel. And he's saying that this called out group, which was the Jews, would stand on him as their foundation. As I pen this teaching, May I remind you that this evening begins Shabbat and the Torah Pasha or the Torah portion for the week is Pashat Ikev, which is from Deuteronomy 7, verse 12 to chapters 11, 25. And Pashat Ikev talks about the blessings of obedience to Yahweh, the dangers of forgetting Yahweh and the directions for taking the land of Israel, Moshe or Moses recalls the making and the remaking of the tablets of stone, the rock, who is again Messiah, the word of God. The indent of the golden calf, Aaron's death, the Levite's duties and the exhortations to serve the Lord, all written on a rock. Now that we have opened up a new realm of understanding that science can only explain the creation process and not challenge it, as well as our deeper understanding that when we hear the word rock, two thoughts should spring to mind. Yeshua is the rock. In Hebrew, we would say Yeshua Tusur, Yeshua the rock. In Greek, we would say Yeshua Petra, Jesus the rock. And we are a fragment of a rock, which is Petros. So let's move to Matthew 3 verse 16 to 17, where Yeshua gets immersed in the waters of the Yarden, two important supernatural events take place. The immerser sees the Ruah, the Spirit of God, come down as a wind on the Lord as a dove. This is the first time the wind took a shape. It came as a dove. Secondly, the voice of the Father from heaven confirming that this rock was his son. In Genesis 15, the Lord confirms to Abraham his covenant province, his covenant promise, that he will be his shield and his exceeding reward. Moreover, the Abrahamic covenant carries the same promises to you and to me to date. Young David was anointed, in short, set apart for the Lord. Although he still tended the sheep of his family, was suddenly asked by his father, Yeshi, to take bread, a future uh, example of what the covenant of bread would be with the Messiah, to his brothers in the valley of Elah, who ridiculed him for leaving the sheepfold to visit them. Was not the rock Yeshua too rejected when he came as the bread of life to Israel? It's a great parallel that we see. David came to feed his brothers and so did Yeshua. But when David heard another voice of an uncircumcised one who is not in covenant with the Messiah, a Philistine called Goliath from Gath, he steps up to the new challenge to bring down he who would insult the armies of the Most High God. In 1 Samuel 17.40, not only does does he take up the challenge to fight Goliath, but he bends down and takes five stones or five rocks. Have you ever wondered why David picked up five stones and the symbolism behind it? Goliath had four brothers, thus one rock or one stone to fell each one of them. Number two, five stands for grace of Hashem upon his followers. Number three, five also stands for the five books of the Torah. And number four, as David was of the same lineage of Messiah, the Lord would open up the fivefold ministry to his body of believers post-Pentecost. 
Did you know that in prophecy there is a scripture of the rock that flies through the air and destroys all the kingdoms of the world? Daniel 2, 34 Thou sawest until a rock was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Daniel 2, 45 Inasmuch as you saw that stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Brothers and sisters, I am going to end part 1 now, and part 2 will follow shortly. Welcome to part 2 of the wind behind the rock. We learned from the prophet Daniel that in the vision he saw a rock which was not cut out of human hands but by the Lord himself who brought down the symbol of the statue or the vision that uh, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw of the kingdoms of this world. So here is clear proof of the rock Yeshua who is the most formidable opponent to ever be challenged and now you will understand why David relied on a rock to fly through the air to drop the biggest giant to confront the Israelites. The, the prophet Isaiah prophesizes a future event where the rock will come down from heaven and destroy all the armies in a place in Hebrew called Ha Megiddo or in English called Amegadon. Isaiah 63 1 who is it that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? Is that is glorious in his appear, appear, apparel, marching in greatness and his sight, that I speak in righteousness, mighty to save? Wherefore art thou red in thy apparel, and thy garments like him that are treaded in the wine vat? I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the peoples there was no man with me. Yea, I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. And their life bud is sprinkled upon my garments. And I have stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. And the year of my redemption is come. Here the Lord is talking about a future event of Revelation chapter 19. Therefore, when David swung his sling in the air and released the rock, it was really as if the Lord himself was flying through the air at Goliath to hit him on the forehead and drop him once and for all. In 1 Peter 2.4, the word of God says, And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. In Acts 4.11, the word of God says, He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. In 2 Peter 2.6, the word of God says, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Brothers and sisters, I'm sure you can agree that all of us who have fallen upon this stone will never, never be ever disappointed. Now comes Hazon or the revelation. In Matthew 21, 44, the word of God says, He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Now let me just pause there. It says, but whomever it falls will be scattered him like dust. Two different groups of people. When we are broken on him, we break to pieces to be remade in his image. But if the stone falls on some other person, they will be scattered like dust. In short, we have fallen in surrender on him, the rock of our salvation. But those like Goliath and the future armies of the Antichrist, they shall fall and be scattered like the dust to the four corners of the earth. Let's get into more revelation from the scriptures on this. Yeshua is prophesizing about the imminent future. In John 16, 7, the word of God says, 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him unto you. And he, when he is come, will convict the world respect of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to the Father and ye behold me no more of judgment because the prince of this world hath been judged. I have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he the spirit of truth is come. He shall guide you into all the truth, for he shall not speak from himself, but what things soever he shall hear, these he shall speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. In Acts chapter 2, the apostles are gathered, not in the upper room as taught by 99% of churches globally, but are really in the temple at the third hour of the day, which is 9 a.m. in the morning, for the morning sacrifice, together with thousands of other Jews from all parts of the world, because it was the feast of Pentecost or Shabbat. Then the entire inner and outer temple shudders by the force of a wind from heaven, and everyone except the, except the twelve apostles were running around in a manner of dismay, as the wind swept through the temple, and suddenly these twelve were speaking in tongues and were seen over their head flames of fire that did not burn them. In Hebrew, the word for the wind, the breath and the spirit is one word, ruah. So in reality, wherever the wind was spent in scripture, the word was ruah. In the Hebrew learning, we learn the word drash. And drash is a part of our study for digging deeper into the word for more information. So let's drash into scripture. In the Tanakh, the word esh appears 375 times and has many different meanings depending on what the sentence would form. Basically, esh means fire. But in many instances, it means the wrath of heavenly fire and in one case, in Genesis 2, where the Lord takes the rib out of Adam and fashions Eve, he says in his word, he made them both man and woman, Esh and Esha, Esh and Esha. Therefore, man created in his likeness can also mean that the fire of the Lord is in his original creation and when the Israelites witness the thunder and fire on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, they were frightened and when Moses delayed on the mount and came down, many of them were intoxicated and were fornicating. Thus, 3,000 perished that day when Esh came down from heaven on Mount Sinai. When the Ruach HaKodesh or the Esh of God returned to Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, as promised by the Lord in John 16, not only did people experience the same ruah or wind that hit Mount Sinai thousands of years ago, they also experienced the fire, the esh of God. But this time, it was the second baptism of fire of the ruah HaKodesh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To conclude, brothers and sisters, we learned about the composition of rocks, we know now that the rock in scripture is Yeshua and his anointing came upon him as the Ruach HaKadosh came upon him as the wind and then formed into a dove. We also learned that the wind and fire came down on the Israelites on the first Pentecost mentioned in scripture on Mount Sinai during the leadership of Moses. Thousands of years later, on the same day of Pentecost, the same fire and wind came down of the Ruach HaKadosh upon the apostles as the Ruah and the Esh came upon them. And amazingly, the 3,000 that fell at Mount Sinai came back into salvation in a reversal of that event 
and 3,000 accepted the Lord in the temple. Today, brothers and sisters, the living rocks are us. We, we are those living rocks or stones, as you might prefer to call yourselves. And must know this fact, just as a meteorite or a mass of rocks plummet through the night skies, they are propelled by a force of fire and wind. No one can see the wind, but they know that which propels the rock or the meteorite emits fire due to its speed of flight. We have the assurance from the word of God that the same Ruach HaKadosh, the wind, the spirit and the breath of the living God, who is Esh, has sealed us. And if you are wondering why you are being pushed to be a witness, the answer is, if you are the rock that God has created, if you are a Petros, a fragment of the main rock, Yeshua, then it is the Ruach HaKadosh that's behind you and propelling you to be his witnesses. Therefore, when you lay hands to cast out demons or heal the sick, what happens? It is the Esh that is coming out of you, the Dunamis firepower of the living God. That is the power. I have heard so many testimonies, brothers and sisters, of many people who have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they keep saying, there's fire upon me, there's fire upon me. That brother and sister is the Esh of God that you are experiencing. Let me conclude with the promise of God that came from heaven as the Ruah and the Esh, that you may remember that you are in covenant with him. The whole chapter of Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Messiah. Even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love, having foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Yeshua HaMashiach unto himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he made us abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, making known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him unto a dispensation of the fullness of times, to sum up all things in Messiah, the things in heaven and the things upon the earth. In him I say, in whom also we were made a heritage, having been foreordained according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we should be unto the praise of his glory. We who had been before hoped in Messiah, in whom ye also, having heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having also believed, you were sealed with the Ruach HaKadosh of promise, which is an earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption. Brothers and sisters, I don't think at any stage anybody can point a finger at you because this scripture clearly proves that we were not a part of the economy of God, but through the grace and will of the Father, through the sacrifice of Messiah, we have been now sealed by the breath, by the wind, and by the Spirit of our Lord. And this is the promise called our inheritance and our redemption. It is my prayer this Shabbat evening that you are filled with the Holy Spirit, I pray the Esh of God upon you that this entire week and the months to come that you will be propelled as you are now a fragment of the rock, that you will be propelled by the Ruach HaKadosh, the Spirit, the breath and the fire of the Holy Spirit upon you. Blessings and Amen to you.